Okay. I'm going back a little bit in time. Since I can draw on the board. Woo uh, we were talking about our demand changes. The tartation preferences change. Our incomes change. The price of substitutes change. The price of complements changes. And when any of that stuff changes, our expectations change. When those things change, it changes the way we feel about the product. It changes our willingness and ability to buy the product. So it changes our demand for the product. And that's when you get a whole new demand curve. If it's good news, the demand curve is going to shift out to the right. If the price for this $2, well, we used to buy three of them, but now we're willing to buy seven of them if it was $3. If the price was one dollar, well, we used to be willing to buy six of them when the price was a dollar, but now because of whatever's happening, we're willing to buy fourteen of them. Right? No matter what the price is, we're willing to buy more. We're able to buy more because something happened to the price of substitutes, to the price of complements, our expectations, our income, our preferences. Maybe this is good news. And what what, what product do we want to talk about today? Water. Yeah, water. Bottled water. Bottled water. Okay. And you environmentalists should not be drinking bottled water. There's very few things in society that's worse for the environment than bottled water. When you can walk across the hallway and fill up a cup instead of all of the plastic that's involved when you read these bottles of water and it's pumped from a city water source in some city halfway across the country. Throwing that out there. Yes, I am throwing some shade right off the bat. <laughs> so, bottle of water. Our okay, our demand, people's demand for bottled water is going up. We're buying more bottled water this week than we we did last week. Why? Does, does water taste any different than it did last week? No. Is Walmart or Food Line, are they jacking the price up or are they putting it on sale? No, the price is still the same, but we're buying more. The water is still the same product, but we're buying more. Well, because we prefer to have something to hydrate ourselves when our power goes out for three or four days. Because drinking warm water is one thing. Drinking warm soda is like nasty, right? So we do, And warm water, well, you can like break the... Bottled water, you can use it to brush your teeth. Bottled water, you can use it to wash your hair if you have no electricity for three or four days. I dare you to wash your hair with a Dr. Pepper. So, bottled water has more uses, right, in a storm scenario. For those of y'all following along on the internet, sometime in the future, we have a hurricane that's supposed to hit in a couple of days. So, we prefer to have, you know, extra bottled water on hand when a storm comes. So, we're buying more bottled water this week and next week, right? So, Normally, I use the, is it good news? You know, we're just gonna increase the demand of water, but you know, hurricane ain't exactly good news, so that's like the one. <laughs> this is my 15th year here teaching this class, and I taught it several times at Patrick Henry, and this is the first time that I actually came across bad news increasing our demand. So that, I mean, not counting like, <laughs> but they, I mean, there's other things like next week, it's gonna be plywood for people to be repairing the damage to their stuff, right? We're gonna be buying more plywood next week than this week because my house isn't damaged this week, it's gonna be damaged next week, right? Yes, I hope not too. Um, okay, somebody else, Bob's house is gonna be damaged next week, right? Bob D's word. Okay. I've never went down that rabbit hole before. So, we, if it's bad news, Word comes out. Word comes out that drinking bottled water is bad for the environment, and all of the environmentalists are like, "Ooh, we're going to stop drinking bottled water." And if we see people who are drinking bottled water, we're going to like, I don't know, throw paint on them, just in case they're also wearing fur coats, right? You animal killers. You. But so we, so then people are going to be like, "Well, I don't want to drink bottled water because I don't want people to throw paint on me." So oh, crap, I, I would prefer not to be covered with paint, right? Yes. <laughs> so the joke would be on that. Technically, it it might actually be battery because contact was made. Assault is a threat. Battery is contact. They didn't make contact. 
the pain did. Yeah, that was that project. It was a projectile. For, uh, otherwise, you know, I didn't kill you. The bullet did. You know, <laughs> just, <laughs> so. yes. Um, so welcome to my law class. Now, um, so uh, that's why you get guilty of assault and battery. I'm going to punch your lights out, and then I hit you a second later. I assaulted you. I threatened you, and then I battered you with paint. Um, so we prefer not to be covered with paint. So we're going to start drinking less bottled water. We're going to take our bottled water. We're going to pour it in a cup and throw the bottle away before we go out in public. Or you can actually buy a buy water. If you, you're worried about your water at home, get a little water filter thing and put it on your sink or something like that. And that's actually what we do now. And I got finally all them Yeti cups that people have been using all these years. I finally got a non-Yeti Yeti cup like I don't know a couple of years ago, and I'm like, how did I live my life without having one? Because those things are phenomenal <laughs> and they will pay for it. I mean, you put ice cubes in the thing and you come back the next morning and you still have 90% of your ice cubes are still in there and solid. Like that's just, yeah. Coffee too. Yeah, Th this thing here, it is a Yeti type device because what I, it's got the rubber gasket on the top. So when I put my can in there, there is it's more or less vacuum seal. So it's vacuum seal is the secret. So then molecules can't transfer heat into the can, can't transfer cold out of the can. So the thing doesn't sweat and the drink stays colder longer because you know this classroom is warm and if I take this sucker out and I had that can sitting out, it'll warm in 20 minutes. But anyways, oh, I don't have to be wiping. Anyway, so we prefer not to get paint on us. So we're gonna buy less bottled water and we're gonna start drinking out of our own house. We're gonna like go ahead and buy ourselves one of the fake Yeti cups and keep on trucking. Kind of thing. And those things are everywhere. You can buy, get them just about anywhere for not much money anymore. I actually give them one free. Got a couple of them free, believe it or not. So, and the one thing about that that I just, we talk about, okay, the price, if the price changes, you're moving. Did we do this? <coughs> Uh, we've talked about it, but we didn't. We got to hear it stop. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when the price changes, we're just moving to a different point on the same line. Well, they jacked the price up, so I ain't going to buy as much. But I still love it, or I still hate it. If Suntrop goes up to $5 a can, well, that's not going to change the way it tastes, right? It's going to change the way it. I'm still going to love it because I love the taste. I just can't afford to buy as much of it because my wife won't give me that much money. That much of your money. That much of my money, yes. What's mine is hers, what's hers is hers. I surrender all. So, yes, that song of all. Um, so if the price changes, you move into a different point on the same domain curve. If anything else changes, anything on that list, taste preferences, substitutes, compliments. Oh, okay, I'm gonna go back to that other slide in for a minute. Okay, we're talking bottled water. What's a substitute for bottled water? What could you drink if you didn't want to drink bottled water? Gatorade. Gatorade. So, if the price of Gatorade gets cheaper, what are we going to do? Take it one step at a time. If Gatorade gets cheaper, we're going to buy more Gatorade. And if we're buying more Gatorade, what are we going to buy less of? Water. Because you're not going to be like, man, that Gatorade sure made me thirsty. And let me drink water, right? I hope not. Because those are substitutes for one another. So if Gatorade went down in price, you'd expect a significant drop off in the price of bottled water. I mean, in the sales of bottled water. Which might constitute a price drop in water. Keep which, going. yeah, which that will, okay, so, we're running with it. So, what, let's say what the price of bottled water was a dollar, then Gatorade got cheap, so the new demand for bottled water is out here, and a bottled water company might say, well, this is our new reality, where on this new reality we want to play, so they may be like, well, we're going to try to we'll lower our price to 75 cents, try to stop the bleeding to try not to lose quite as many customers. But this is what the new demand looks like. That's it. This line here is what the new reality looks like because Gatorade became cheaper. 
So then they'll move to a different point on this line, but they're moving to a different point on this line because this is where we are since Gatorade has changed. They ain't moving to a different point on this line. Because this exists no more. Hopefully tomorrow, Gatorade will raise their prices back and a bottle of water company survives. So. Um, so let okay. Um, what happens if the price of spark plugs goes up? What's going to happen to the demand for bottled water? Ooh, this is a tricky one here. Nothing. Have any of you ever had to buy spark plugs? Have any of you ever had to tune up a vehicle? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you got to tune up your vehicle, you got to tune up your vehicle. And if it costs you $20 worth of spark plugs, okay. Well, if it costs you $40 worth of spark plugs, that's that much more money that you're spending on spark plugs, that much less money you have to spend on everything else. And some of that everything else might end up being on the water. So what may end up happening is spark plugs get more expensive Gasoline gets more expensive. Toilet paper gets more expensive, but they're not that closely related, but there will be an impact. It might be itty bitty impact, because we don't think of spark plugs and bottled water in the same sentence, but if I've got $40 less to spend this month, what's gonna happen? Well, that's probably one less 12 pack of sun drop that I go through. That's probably one Snickers bar less that I go through. That's two bags of Cheetos less that I go through and a couple of bottles of water. That's not my, my 20 bucks, right? Because I got to cut back somewhere, right? For y'all, gasoline, if it goes back up to $4 a gallon, you're like, well, I don't have much money. And now I have nothing left over after I fill up my tank. So those other things that you were buying are going to go away. For some of you, I got to get a tune up. I'm going to buy less water. For some of you, I got to get a tune up. I'm going to buy less Cheetos. For some of you, I got to get a tune up. I'm going to cancel my Netflix account for a month. I'm going to put that on hold for a month. Do they still let you put your Netflix on hold for a month? If you they come back, no, they don't. They, you don't have to. Oh, you have to full out cancel it. Okay. Uh, that's one of the things about the YouTube red or whatever. They'll let you just put a pin on it for a month and then come back. But you got to give up something when the price of spark plugs goes up. And you have to, and people have to buy spark plugs. So some people might give up water. The more closely related the products are, the bigger the change in the demand for one that you're going to see when something happens to the other. But even if they aren't that related, there's going to be an impact. And here's what, everything is related in any way. Everything, you, you have compliments like Dr. Pepper and Doritos. Oh, well, I was going to say Cheetos. Okay, she's got Doritos. Dr. Pepper Doritos. Because what goes better with a bag of Doritos than Dr. Pepper? Maybe mine do. Yeah, I said mine do not sound drop because that was my breakfast when I was in high school. Never yeah, we weren't. But, uh, but Dr. Pepper and Doritos. Well, if the price of Dr. Pepper goes down, she's going to drink more Dr. Pepper. She's likely to eat more Doritos too, right? Because they're closely related. But Dr. Pepper and Doritos are also, so they're complements, right? But they're also substitutes because they're competing with each other to get that limited amount of money that Jenny has in her pocket. Jenny likes Dr. Pepper, Jenny likes Doritos. If Dr. Pepper goes to $20 a bottle, Doritos go up to the $20 a bag, she's gotta start making a choice, right? But ideal is for her to drink one and eat the other, but she's gotta start making a choice somewhere along the line because she's limited the amount of, if they, if they go from a dollar a piece to $2 a piece, well that ain't, that's, it is, but it isn't that significant of a thing, but she's gonna have to cut back a little bit. Right now, her paycheck, she makes enough money to where she can buy 100 bottles of Sundrop of Dr. Pepper a week. <laughs> she can buy 100 bags of Doritos a week. But when her paycheck, if the, when the prices go up, she can't buy 100 bottles of Dr. Pepper anymore. She can't buy 100 bags of Doritos anymore. So they all are competing when it does sells. 
if she only had a hundred, if, if, if they cost a hundred dollars a piece, if she only had to make, had a hundred dollars in her pocket, well, she can't buy them both. So she's got to make a tough choice. She was hugging her bottle of Dr. Pepper a moment ago for those of y'all following along online, but so apparently that choice is made. But so in the grand scheme of things, you're going to have, you may have the, well, this is happening because their complements, so demand goes back here, but then the substitutability bumps it back a little bit. It's like putting a parachute on the back of a dragster. The faster that dragster is going, the more wind resistance that parachute is doing, right? So in reality, we don't lose sleep over that. In reality, you may end up getting a double move on things. The other thing, just for you visual learners, this is built for bottled water. It didn't matter whether they were 50 cents a piece or whether five bucks a piece, he was going to drink the same amount. Just so you visual people can see what that looked like. Um, my demand for sun drop is pretty steep. More expensive it gets, I am going to cut back, but not a whole lot, right? If it goes from Right now, at a dollar a piece, I'm trying to call it 14 of them a week. If they go up to $2 a piece, well, I may cut back, you cut back to 11, right? So they double in price. I'm going to go from four, drinking 14 of them down to 12 or 11, right? I start mixing in an occasional Pepsi, an occasional Coke, and occasional Dr. Pepper. But then we had the this version. Was that you, Matt? Or the same person that it doesn't matter what price is. The only price I will ever pay for a bottle of water in this case is a dollar and a half. The dollar forty-nine, I ain't buying any. The dollar fifty-one, I ain't buying any. I'm only gonna buy it at buck fifty, and at a buck fifty, they ain't no telling how many of them I'm gonna buy. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Oh heck no. So you're never gonna see that one in reality. Anyway, just since my board wasn't working the other day, I thought I would get that too quick. Okay. So we started, we've talked about this a couple times. I think we hit this the other day. Yeah, we did, because we talked about the star in cars. It is we get less usefulness out of each extra item that we consume, so we would be less willing to pay for that extra item. So, you know, two beers is better than one beer, but after that seventh beer, you ain't getting much enjoyment out of it. So what is it y'all do? The first two, three beers that you drink, you drink the good stuff. The stuff with flavor, but then you start getting numb and that kind of stuff. Your taste buds are going away. So what's the point in drinking expensive beer when you can't taste it anymore? So that's when you switch to Beast Light. That y'all are too young to understand. But then you switch to Beast Light, and you ain't paying as much for it, but you're fine with it because you can't taste it. But then you get to the point of I don't want to drink another one. It ain't going to cost me a whole lot, but I don't want to drink it because it's going to make me throw up. You certainly don't want to pay it. We asked the other day how much would you be willing to pay? No, that's going to be a supply thing that we haven't gotten to yet. Yes. So, um, so if you've already eaten four or five slices of pizza and you pull, or 22 slices of extra pizza way back in the day. And that was a skinny little wreck. Um, four or five pizzas, slices of pizza, you're full. At half price, would you eat another one? No. Well, how low would it have to go? We all get to have ever, any of you ever eaten at a buffet any, anywhere in your life? Golden Corral, Pizza Hut, was it Pinos? Did Pinos used to have one? Or, anyway, I don't know. Little Caesars. Not Little Caesars. Um, is it just Caesars? CC's. Oh, yeah. CC's. If you want, like, uh, ooh, I'm not going to talk smack about it. Damn, I can't afford <laughs> another lawsuit. No. But the, I haven't been sued yet. Knock on for my good. Uh, you get to it. You pay to get the first plate. Everything that you do after that is free, right? And then you get to the point of it ain't worth free. Even if free, they're giving me food. I ain't gonna eat any more of it, right? The only cost it costs you to fill up that go back to the pizza bar, CC's for your fifth plate, is it costs you the energy to waddle across the restaurant? You don't do it because it's, you you just don't want it. So 
the price has to be below free in order to get you to pay to do that. And they ain't gonna go below free. We're, we're gonna pay you to eat more food than you really want. That's not a good sustainable business model. Now, if you got if you've got a YouTube channel and the YouTube channel is about filming people throwing up or something like that, then yeah, you might like to pay people to go up there and eat and film it and get your views, but okay. So a few definitions for you here. A normal good, a normal product is something that normally, when we get more money, we're gonna buy more of it. Loveline loves M&Ms. Give her more money, she's gonna buy more M&Ms. Jenny loves Dr. Pepper. Give her more money, she'll drink more Dr. Pepper. That's just, it's what we do. As our incomes go up, we buy more. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Why? When you don't have much income, what are you going to be buying? What do you buy first? The essentials. The, the essentials, the things you need, and then what? If you don't have much money, you're only going to spend it on things you really, really like, right? So it kind of stands to reason that when you have a little bit of money, those things you spend that money on are things that are really, really important to you, things you really, really like. So you get more money, well, yeah, you can buy more of them. Yeah, you'll go adventurous and buy some other things that you've never bought before, but you're kind of going to buy more of what it is that you're buying because you really, really like it, right? Except if it is an inferior good. Inferior means not superior. Inferior means bad, right? Generally bad. An inferior product is something that when you get more money, you buy less of it. Think department store brand toilet paper. When you ain't got much money, what are you doing? You use the Food Lion brand, right? But you get more money, your income is better. Well, I deserve better than that. And you go out and you buy whatever the downy, soft, cloud, whatever, fluffy Charmin, whatever, right? Hmm? I don't know. Down to you, I was about to say, yeah, that's a little laundry detergent. <laughs> oh, just, okay. Cloud, salt, what, just do, right? The good stuff. <coughs> oh, when money is cheap, you don't have much money. Jenny doesn't have much money, but she's got to have her Dr. Pepper. So in order to allow her to drink all the Dr. Pepper she needs, well, she's getting that John Wayne toilet paper. Except for the leather and doesn't take any crap off anybody, right? Okay. <laughs> I tried to spike the ball, hit the net, and fell to the floor, apparently. Okay. So, um, she's going to be, you know, do you think Bill Gates uses department store toilet paper? No. Do you think Bill Gates eats generic soda or a generic cereal? No. Because they get more money. We stop eating spam and we start eating actual hamburgers, right? Hamburgers and hot dogs instead of spam and finding the sausages. Yeah, a bad product is something that when our customers get more money, they go away from us. Okay, and, and, and that's fine. It's not saying that all of your customers are going to flee, but you might you, you might still eat keep eating your fried spam. But then you might end up finding, well, I, I still like it, but I'm not eating as much because I got enough money that I'm eating filet mignon three times a week now instead of eating fried spam seven days a week. So it still is a reduction. And that's what you get with an inferior good. Normally, for most everything, most things are normal for our behavior. We get more money and we're going to buy more of it. But there are those things, that the, the, the store brand versions of the cereal and the toilet paper, the toothpaste and that kind of stuff. You buy it. Go with me on that, that, that difference there. Yeah. All right, let me snap your brain for a second. In the grand scheme of things, everything is an inferior good at some point. Right now, y'all are dirt poor college students. If somebody comes rolling up to you with a, hey, I got a brand new Kia, you're like, dude, score. <laughs> a Kia is something that you wish you had instead of that 73 Pinto that you do have. If you have a 73 Pinto, please walk home. Just don't even get in it. Just, <laughs> just roll it to the dumpster and just put it. Anyway. Oh. Are they in first car? No. 
I was say, it sounds like you have some personal experience. <laughs> yeah, no, but just, no, I mean, have you been in the 73 Pinto? Just pick an AMC Pacer and everybody's bad. I'm just, anyway. So, um, right now, y'all would be like, y'all would be happy if y'all got a brand new Kia. But you make more money, you could be like, well, yeah, I could buy a Kia, but I got enough money. I could step up to a Toyota. I could step up to a Honda. That Kia is inferior now. Because I got enough money, I can afford a better vehicle than a Kia. I can drive a Honda. You make more money, and I can afford a Lexus. Make more money, I can afford, and so that Toyota is inferior. Make even more money, I can buy a Mercedes. So suddenly, that Toyota is inferior. Right now, a Toyota, you be, or a Lexus, y'all be like, dude, I wish I had. But you get to some stage, you're like, that Lexus isn't good enough. If your income is high enough, that Lexus isn't good enough. That Mercedes might not be good enough. You ride around in Rolls Royce. That Rolls Royce might not be good enough if you're flying around in Gulfstream 5. Right? But then what is the Gulfstream 5 inferior to? Not much, except maybe that space X rocket that I have on my wallpaper, right? Yeah. So, and except for whatever the product is at the top of the food chain, at some point along the way, everything is gonna be an inferior good. But where, it just depends on where the customers are. For y'all, right now, a Kia is a normal good. It's something you aspire to. Hopefully. Uh, well, not quite a luxury good, but well, maybe it is a luxury good for y'all. A luxury good is when your income goes up, you'll buy more, but you got to have a significant increase in your income. So, okay, for a lot of you, a Kia right now is a luxury good. It ain't even normal, right? But hopefully, what do y'all hope to be doing five, ten years from now? Y'all going to go here for a couple of years. You're going to transfer somewhere else. You're going to go there for a couple of years. Then you're going to, I don't know, any of you going to law school, medical school? Dental school? Well, you got to wait until you're 35 on that one, so good luck with that. So, <clears throat> the, the aliens may be coming before then. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> aliens. Uh, they got, they're redoing the predator. It looks like his mouth. Anyway. Anyway. Um, Okay, y'all with me? Five, five, years from now. Okay, five years now, 10 years now, where do y'all hope to be? You're going to be somewhere making $60,000, $70,000 a year, living in a whole lot better place than you're living in now, right? So the place you're living in now is inferior. How many of you are going to keep living where you're living now in five years now, 10 years from now? Living in the same house, living in your parents' basement, driving that same car that you're driving now? I hope not, same. yes. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's what, that's what y'all are hoping for. But right now, what is a luxury item to you right now? What is normal to you? Hopefully, in the future, you're going to be, I've improved my quality of life. I've moved beyond that. Instead of using whatever that blister pack cell phone is that I get from Walmart for $50 or something like that, I can actually afford the real, the newest, the latest, and greatest iPhone. Instead of a little iPhone SZ from Straight Talk with a little screen and a slow processor. And seriously. Or that little whatever LG stylo whatever piece of <laughs> Android phone. Yeah, no, you get the you know, the Pixel three, baby. <gasps> right. Or the Note nine. Right. That's so we get to move on. And uh, a luxury good is something. Our income will go up. It's got to go up a whole lot before we buy it. How much does your income have to increase before you buy your first helicopter? A oh lot. You gotta be I want to kind of like making at least five hundred thousand dollars a year, probably. Unless you can build it yourself. Unless you can build it yourself. So good luck with that. Yes. Um, but if you can build it yourself, I dare say that you got a job that's making you five hundred thousand dollars a year. You just, um, so, how much does your income gonna have to go up before you buy your first jet? A lot. Twice that. Before your first luxury yacht, a lot. So that's where things are. For my son, this phone is a luxury item because his income's got to go up significantly more than a couple bucks a week because he's a kid. No, he's 13. Yeah, he just turned 13. What year is this? Yes, 13. So, so, when 
prices change. It changes our behavior. If Cheeto, I mean, if Doritos, oh no, if Dr. Pepper gets more expensive, Jenny is going to drink less Dr. Pepper. Well, since she loves Doc Doritos, she's going to be eating less Doritos too, right? There's going to be a change there. If Dr. Pepper gets cheaper, is she going to drink even more Dr. Pepper? Maybe a little bit more, but not a whole lot more. But the cheaper Dr. Pepper will free up some of the money, free up some money to where she can buy more of something else. Spark plugs, Doritos, Spam, whatever it is that she wants to buy. Hmm? <laughs> Not bottled water this week. So, when the prices prices of products, like I said, more closely related, the bigger the impact you're going to get. But when the price changes, you get what we call the income effect. When the price of one product goes down, and that's going to let you buy more of that product. Dr. Pepper gets cheaper. Jenny can buy more Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper becoming cheaper is the same thing as Jenny getting a pay raise because she can buy more of the stuff she's already buying. So that's what we call the income effect. The price is going down, it's acting like an increase in your paycheck. But we also have what's called the substitution effect. The price of doctor, this happens here, is a reduction in the price of one good lets you buy more of something else. Jenny, you said three Dr. Peppers a day? Yep. Okay. Let's call that, let's see, Dr. Pepper's buck and a half a day, a buck and a half each. Okay, let's just call five dollars worth of Dr. Pepper a day right now. So times seven, she's going through, she's spending thirty-five dollars a week to buy Dr. Pepper. Yes. But Dr. Pepper lowers the price to a dollar a bottle. So now she can drink her 21 bottles of Dr. Pepper. It only costs her $21. So that just did what? It saved her $14. But is Jenny going to say, well, I had $35 in my budget for Dr. Pepper, so I've got an extra $14. So I'm just going to go out and buy four more, however many more bottles of Dr. Pepper. Yes, I am. <laughs> is, is she locked into the, I'm spending $35 a week on Dr. Pepper, and I'm going to get as much Dr. Pepper as that $35 a week will buy me? And Jenny is suggesting that she would. Jenny's a little half bubble off a plum. Just very very said has a second. That too. <laughs> but if Jenny took this $14 savings and put it toward buying more Dr. Pepper, that would be income effect. But if she took this $14 savings and, well, maybe this $14 savings, she spent some of it on more Dr. Pepper, but maybe she spent some of it buying more bags of Doritos. That would be substitution effect. If you take all the money you save and you plow it back into the same product, that's nothing but it income effect. If you take all the money that you save and you plow it into buying a different product, that would be substitution effect. What do we do in reality? A little bit of both. She's gonna buy a little bit more Dr. Pepper and she's probably gonna buy more Doritos with this extra money that she saved because the price of Dr. Pepper got cheaper. She'll buy a little bit more Dr. Pepper but she'll end up also buying, okay, she'll buy a couple more bottles of Dr. Pepper, a couple more bags of Doritos, a pack of gum, the spark plug, because she stopped piling them for when she needs a tune up. I don't know what else she's going to end up spending this money on. I don't know. Giving Preston a loan so Preston can go out and buy his favorite recreational <laughs> choices. All right. So. I don't think I get some of the loan to do that. <laughs> yes. We've already established that Jenny ain't quite right. <laughs> so instead of spending all the savings on that same product, you take some of that savings to buy something else. That is the substitution effect. For you OCD people, this is a story. You have ten dollars worth of income. In the case of sodas, five bucks, and the pizzas, five bucks. If soda drops cheaper, the income effect means well, I'm buying two cases of soda instead of one, and so I'm still spending my five dollars on soda. I'm still spending my five dollars on pizza. The substitution effect could be, well, I buy one case of soda and I get one and a half pizzas, or I buy one case of soda and a six pack of sodas, get one and a quarter pizza, I get one case of soda, a six pack of soda, a couple of bottles, and get one and eight pizzas, right? However it works out. Are y'all with me? 
Okay, I draw a line in your notes. That's where the test stops. Yeah, we have this test Thursday and you came in late. Yes. We have a test Thursday. It's covering all of the stuff in chapter one, all the stuff in chapter two, and the stuff in chapter three up until here. So the first 25 slides. And first slide of this chapter is just the title, right? So, test Thursday. I utterly forgot about it as far as saying something to y'all the other day about it. I you should have said it last week when we were doing the big test on Tuesday. But it was on the syllabus, so I'm covered. <laughs> We have a biology test Thursday morning, too. Cool. Which is great. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> biology is a science. This is a social science. It'll work. <laughs> I'll write that on my test instrument. Yes. Um, I'm trying to figure out how I can put two and two together between the two, make a connection. Look, just Miss Reed has. A, Skeleton on a rack, and it's got the pumpkin head on it. Does it still have the pumpkin head on it? Maybe soon. Okay, maybe it's going to be coming back. That pumpkin head was done by this guy. That skeleton used to live here in a corner. And after a while, I just couldn't have a headless skeleton standing here in my classroom, so I did give him a pumpkin head there for a while. He's sitting there holding a stuffed animal. Um, we had a little, anyway. So, <laughs> econ class, skeleton. So, there we go. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that would be more anatomy and physiology rather than straight up biology. So. Well, econ, why'd you have because the nursing class had been in here once for something and then they got left behind and they didn't have the class in here anymore. And then it was like, like this joker, I can't, we had a name for him. But I mean, he was in here for like two or three years. Then Martha Reed just happened to come by one day and I, there's where he is. <laughs> He'd been here the whole time. Actually, he was here for a while and he was gone for a while and he ended up back in here again. And then, then she discovered him. I didn't really need him, so <laughs> I let him go. But but I brought her cow skull a few years ago, and I'm like, she needs to put that on the head of the human. Here we go. Ooh, get a dog skull and do the Anubis thing. <laughs> so see those those bringing in the Greek mythology, whatever thing things those get your English legend or whatever. Cross curriculum. That's what we believe in. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> so, enough of that insanity. Uh, the supply, to go back, what was the definition of supply? My definition. Willingness, inability to produce. What was our definition of demand? Willingness, inability to consume. Okay. That one will be a question on what the definition of supply. We talked about that earlier in the chapter, so that one would be a question on a test. Willingness and ability to produce supply, yeah. willingness and ability to consume, huh? Yeah. It depends. A little bit of everything. Just do you think I've made the test? If you do, you're incorrect. I didn't remember about this test. You will find with me I never get ahead on stuff, never. And, and part of that's on purpose because I want to find out where we stop. So where's a good stopping point so I know where to go? Um, so supply is our willingness and ability to consume. And the supply depends on the behavior of all of those people that are willing and able to supply or produce the good. Yeah, Seven, uh, most of y'all were able to grow watermelons, but most of you weren't willing. Or actually, most of you actually were willing if the price got high enough, right? But there's a couple of you that weren't able, and that's where Sam here, moment in sun, is on its way. The market supply is going to be the total quantities that all the sellers are making. You add up all the supply of all of the individuals. How many watermelons was Matthew going to able and willing to produce? How many watermelons was Connor willing and able to produce? How many watermelons was Tyler willing and able to produce? How many watermelons was Sam willing and able to produce? Put all that together, you've got how many watermelons is everybody willing and able to produce? That's going to be the total market supply. Right. 
just like we had a total market demand thing of all of the watermelon buying that we were doing, you got total total market supplying all the watermelons that we're willing to be able to grow and sell. See people writing is why we're pausing. Just like we had a law of demand, we have a law of supply, and that's saying when the price goes up, people make more. That's the English version. The price goes up, people produce more. We produce more. A lot of y'all said, well, I've got a backyard, I've got a garden hose, I can spit seeds, so I am able to grow watermelons. And right now the price is low enough, I ain't growing them. But if the price went up to $10 a piece, some of y'all got interested. If the price went up to $40 a piece, a lot of y'all got interested. If the price went up to $100 a piece, everybody was growing, right? So that's law of supply. When the price goes up, more people can do it, more people will do it. That doesn't mean people are gonna buy, that's separate stuff. But we'll get to what's determining that price next Tuesday. We're gonna run out of that. But what we can do is we can do, just like we had a demand schedule, we can do a supply schedule. How many packs of gum are people willing to produce if they could sell them for a buck and a quarter a piece? How many packs of gum would people produce if they could only sell them for a dollar a piece? How many packs of gum would people be willing to produce if they could sell them for 12, I mean for 75 cents each? And you can graph it and get a curve that, well, here I graphed those actual numbers I had, but a normal looking supply curve is going to look more like this. A normal looking supply curve is going to look more like that black line than the red one. But just for you mathematical completists, I actually graphed the numbers that I had, and I'm just not smart enough to go in there and change my numbers for your graph. Because Keep forgetting about it to be honest with you. But the supply curve, when the price goes up, we're buying more. Right? I mean we're making more. <laughs> because how many of you are interested in growing watermelons and selling them if you can only get a buck or two a piece? It ain't worth the time. But if you could get 20 bucks a piece, yeah, it would be worth the time. Maybe to do a little bit. If you could get a hundred bucks a piece, it might be worth it to drop out of college and start going into watermelon business, right? Yep. What about like as far as like the watermelon is, if it costs a hundred dollars and you make your own, would that would that change it? I'm talking about making to sell. Okay. But you're still gonna have the supply of if watermelon, I go to Walmart and I see watermelons are selling for a hundred dollars a piece. Well, I'm gonna maybe I'm just gonna grow two or three on my own so I can eat them. And so I ain't gotta pay their inflated prices. But a lot of enterprising people are going to be like, well, if I'm only going to eat three of them, I might as well grow more than three of them and try to sell a couple of these suckers. Yeah. But a lot of people, that's why vegetable really isn't the best fruit, isn't the best example for this because we sometimes we grow our own so we can avoid buying it from Walmart or Food Line. We grow our own because it just tastes better than what we get there. Right. Mm -hmm. I was I don't have a supply curve definition. We had the law of supply when price goes up, we produce more. Okay. So we had those determinants of demand, we have determinants of supply, and I'm sorry my transition is busted, so you can get four of them over there on the side. What determines our willingness to grow watermelons? What determines our ability to grow watermelons? The first thing is price. Okay. I can't remember if I said it there. If you don't roll with me on the first half of it, then we can get the second half. The price of inputs, ingredients. If you're gonna grow watermelons, what's the cost of the seeds? What's the cost of the water? Those are gonna be something you kinda of need to figure out, right? Watermelons you're selling for $5 a piece, it's gonna cost you $10 to buy the seeds. Forget about it, right? The cost of ingredients. If you wanna open a bakery, you kind of need to know what's the cost of the eggs, the sugar, the flour, the vanilla extract, right? Whatever else goes into a cake. Egg, sugar, flour, vanilla, egg. I'll, I'll go with that, all right. I'm sure there's something significant that I'm forgetting, but okay. Oil, maybe. Okay. I'll buy that. Well, the 
mistakes can make. So ingredients, you can use the word ingredient instead of inputs. The textbook that y'all don't use says inputs. Factor costs. What? Test review. Do you remember the factors of production that we talked about the second day of class? Those things that you have to have before you can start to produce in the first place? Land was one of them. Capital, which is the tools and equipment. Good job. Knowledge. Resources and my workers. Labor. Land, labor, capital, knowledge. If you're going to open a bakery, just because I, I like that example better for this. If you're going to open a bakery, well, before you can bake any cakes, well, you got to have an oven, you got to have a refrigerator, you got to have a mixer. That's your, that's your capital, your tools and equipment. You got to have a building to bake them in because how many of y'all want to go bake, buy a cake that was baked in a field somewhere? Yeah, yeah. that's the knowledge. You got to know how to make a cake, right? How many of you know how to bake? Half of you. The other half of us, <laughs> good luck, right? So, so you gotta have the knowledge, you gotta have the workers, you gotta have the land, the place to do the work, the land and buildings, and what was the one that I skipped? Knowledge, but the tools and equipment. So, if ovens are selling for a million dollars a piece, well, that's kind of gonna slow you down on opening a bakery, right? If land is going for eighteen thousand dollars an acre, that's gonna slow you down a little bit, right? If you can get the land cheap, you can get a building cheap. There's a couple empty restaurants in town. You can rent one of them, and it's already got the oven or refrigerator, and you can rent the building real cheap. That makes it easier to open a restaurant, right? So the ingredients and then the tools that you need, land, labor, capital, and knowledge. You can change that to knowledge. Uh, it, some takes first come entrepreneurial ability, <laughs> and then I turned out to know-how, and I'm like, I really need to do that to knowledge. Land, labor, capital, and knowledge. The next thing is technology. Can maybe enable you to do something that you couldn't do before. Sam is allergic to dirt. That's why he usually comes rolling up when he gets out of the car in the parking lot. He's climbing into a bubble and he's rolling himself up into the building and he like squirts himself in here because the building's relatively clean. I don't know. Or Sam is allergic. So he's allergic to dirt. Can he grow watermelons? No. Okay, maybe wearing a hazmat suit, which is technology that would allow him to be out there and growing watermelons because he has something that will protect him from the dirt that he's allergic to, so he can grow watermelons. The hazmat suit is technology. Maybe the Star Trek replicator thing that you know, he just walks up to the machine, and says, "Computer, watermelon." And pssst, it appears out of nowhere. That would allow him to produce watermelons without ever touching them, right? So that would make it easier for him to produce. So how much easier would it be to produce when you add other technologies to the replicator, like, I don't know, a recorder? So he doesn't have to sit there every five seconds and say, uh, computer, watermelon, he could just sit there and record his voice on loop and have it play every five seconds, so, right? Makes it easier for him to do the job. So, oh, he gets even better. He'll sit there and he'll get a conveyor, a chute, put it in front of the replicator and have it going to the back of a flatbed truck. And he's going to lean that replicator forward a little bit. So when the recorder says computer watermelon, it appears that it's going to roll right down the ramp and into the back of the truck. He never has to touch them. So how much easier is that job going to be? So that replicator can be cracking them out as fast as he says, computer watermelon, because they're rolling, rolling out of the way. The machine ain't waiting for him to pick it up and move it out of the way, carry it down to the truck, and then come back and say, next one. And it ain't hurting his back, right? And then he's got the technolo next technology of the recliner that he's going to be sitting in while the recorder's doing all of this and everything, right? It would enable him to produce when he couldn't produce. Otherwise, growing watermelons would have killed him, right? But the technology allows him to do so. So there's a lot of stuff that we can do that we couldn't do without technology. For you online students that are listening on the recording, how many of you would be college students if you couldn't take your classes online? Technology enables us to do stuff that we couldn't do before. Think about your car. If we didn't have automobiles, what job would you be working? 
that's within bicycle distance of your house? <laughs> Congratulations, you're working on your parents' farm, right? Exciting. And are they paying you? Well, we'll put a roof over your head. Shut up and get back to work, right? <laughs> yes. So, technology enables us to do more in other places. If it weren't for the technology, good four-lane roads and cars and that kind of stuff, I wouldn't be here. Somebody else would be teaching you this class, and y'all would be like, yes. Okay, that was the last one on that side. Okay. So, other goods. Watermelons are expensive. So, maybe I'm interested in growing watermelons. But cantaloupes are cheap. So, I think everybody's going to be eating cantaloupes instead of eating watermelons. So, should I waste my time planting these watermelons? You kind of got to look at what's going on with other goods, right? Because there are some people out there that are strange enough that they consider a cantaloupe to be a substitute for watermelon. That's just wrong, but there are some people out there that think that way. Right? But you do need to consider what's happening with other goods as far as how is that going to impact your decisions on what you're going to make, what you're going to produce, what you're going to do. Taxes and subsidies. Is there any financial help subsidy, any financial help you can get from the government that will help you set up and start a business? Or are there any extra taxes and rules and regulations that you're going to have to deal with when you do open this business? Why in the world of all the places on the planet did Microsoft put a data center in Boynton? I mean, Boynton, really? Have any of you ever driven through Boynton? You've driven through it and not gotten a speeding ticket? Okay, other, other than the Microsoft, what's going on there? No, they got the courthouse that you go to when you get a speeding ticket. And Boynton, luckily, they, they, 58 kind of goes around Boynton instead of going through the old school downtown, downtown Boynton, because that was speed trap. That used to be how they made their money, but they don't have to do that anymore because A, the bypass, B, Microsoft. All right, so, woohoo, thank you, Microsoft. I don't get as many speeding tickets. But Microsoft got help from the government, from the state government of Virginia, to put that data center there. We'll give you a break on property taxes. We'll give you a break on the amount of money you got to pay for your electricity. We'll give you, well, I don't even know what all breaks that they got. What we get, what well, the dream was, we get local people employed at the data center, getting good pay. Yeah, I see you shaking your head. That's why I said the dream. Uh, the dream is local people are going to get paid good paying jobs working in that data center. And then the employees and families that are getting the increase in income, shift in demand, are going to be buying more stuff from the stores and stuff, not only in Boynton, but in the entire county, right? So we're creating more jobs, getting more spending in all the stores, all the restaurants, all that kind of stuff, building more houses for all these employees and all that kind of stuff. They could be luxury goods are becoming normal goods because our paycheck's going up. I'm going to get out of the house I'm living in and get a new house because I'm getting a good paying job at Microsoft store. That was the dream. That's why they did it. But unfortunately, well, we didn't have enough qualified people to work there, so they've had to import a lot of the people that they have. And then those people that they imported, they're like, oh, we're used to living out there in the Seattle Redmond area or somewhere else, so live here. And so they're like living in Richmond or they're living in Raleigh and they're commuting in, so they're not really eating in restaurants in Boynton, they're not living in houses in Boynton, and they're not really employing many people but they're looking to, they want to. Because if you're a Microsoft employee that's been living in the, the big city of Seattle for however many years, do you want to move to Boynton? So they would like to have local people come in there. So if you want to get a job, get an IT degree from here, and go to, go to work from Microsoft, they have hired a number of our graduates. They've still want two or three people from the IT department from here. The, the student, uh, the, the, the student worker, whatever you call them, the, the help desk people, I mean, just about all of them, they work at our help desk for a couple of years and they end up over there at Microsoft. I mean, i thinking of at least three of them that have gone over there. At least three of them that have gone over there. That's two years there. Boom. Here you go. Well, were you thinking about doing that? No. So, taxes and subsidies are going to help from the government to help you set up your business. And guess what? If you want to start a business in Virginia, we I've already talked about how our economy around here has gotten hammered more than a lot of the rest of the economy in the state. 
start, if you want to start a business and you get to create some jobs here in South Side of Virginia, check with the state government. They'll have, I'm, I'm about 100% positive, they'll have some kind of programs, federal or state aid, you can get to help you start a business. If your business could be employing more than you, if you'll be creating about any number of jobs whatsoever, you can get some help from the government to do it because we're trying to stop the bleeding that we have going on around here. Expectations. Watermelons are selling for $100 a piece, but I expect to see in the newspaper tomorrow that eating watermelons causes cancer. Am I gonna plant watermelons? Well, if I could plant watermelons today, if I expect a hurricane to come through in a couple of days time, no, I just could change my willingness and ability to plant watermelon seeds this week, right? So your expectations are going to determine how much. And then the number of sellers. Allison was asking, I think it was Allison was asking a question earlier about the, what well, if, if we're all growing watermelons. Watermelons are selling for $100 a piece. That's the price of watermelons. So I'm going to grow watermelons. You're going to grow watermelons. We're all growing watermelons. So then who's going to buy the watermelons if we all are growing our own watermelons? Right? So you kind of got to look at what, how many people are we competing against? And the more people you're competing against is going to put pressure on the price to go down. If you're going to make, well, we'll get more into that next time. I'll stop there on that talk. Go with me. These are the things you're going to determine our willingness to produce, our ability to produce. As price goes up, we become more able to produce. At a dollar a piece or five dollars a piece, if you don't have a backyard, you can't, you aren't able to get in the watermelon business. I think we had this example a week ago. Loveling, weren't you living in, no, or Preston was living in a 28th story apartment. Was it you? Okay. Preston was living in a 28th story apartment. He doesn't have a backyard. But if watermelons are selling for $100 a piece, does he be able to make enough money off of this business to where he can rent some land or buy some land? Yeah. So he went from being unable to produce to now he's able to produce because the price made him able to produce and he can produce more and y'all would be willing to produce more than what i say at a hundred dollars a piece y'all are throwing dirt on your neighbor's garage and throwing a few seeds up there and hey if only one watermelon grows up there well that's an extra hundred bucks right more power to you we're gonna stop there any questions Comments, anger, frustration. Okay. Well, see you Thursday. Like I say, especially after she's look, I don't think the storm is going to be an issue. But if it ends up being an issue, don't lose any sleep over it. I've got you back. But.